Hey guys, it's Allie. Welcome back to Infertile the podcast. This is episode 202 called Monica. Today's episode is sponsored by Prove, a women's health company dedicated to providing information, proactive fertility testing, and support so they can reach their goals faster. When Prove founder and PhD scientist Amy was trying to get pregnant, she suffered miscarriage after miscarriage, and no test or doctor could explain why. She ultimately turned to IVF to have her son. It was only after she uncovered the source of her troubles, a problem with ovulation, that she successfully conceived, this time only needing a simple, inexpensive supplement. She then set out to create an accurate, effective diagnostic to empower women to test at home. Did you know that ovulation is more than a yes or a no? In fact, it's possible to release an egg, but still not have enough progesterone, the hormone released after ovulation, to support implantation. Prove measures a hormone released after ovulation called PDG that supports implantation and pregnancy and tracks this hormone during the implantation window. A clinical study showed that sustained elevated PDG levels during the implantation window was associated with a 75% increase in successful pregnancies. If Prove testing kits uncover potential issues, the fix can be simple. Prove can also support you with further resources from science-backed supplements to connections with fertility doctors. Prove is truly a game-changing innovation for those battling infertility. So check out Prove, which is spelled P-R-O-O-V. My favorite part is that they're giving Infertile AF listeners a special discount code. So go to ProveTest, that's P-R-O-O-V-T-E-S-T.com, enter the code Alley25, and you'll get 25% off your first Prove order of $25 or more. Again, that's ProveTest.com. Use code Allie, A-L-I-2-5, and you'll get 25% off your first Prove order of $25 or more. Thanks, Prove. This episode is supported by Receptiva DX. The Receptiva DX test can help couples struggling with unexplained infertility. Getting pregnant isn't easy, as so many of you know. Many couples struggle with infertility, and unexplained infertility can be particularly frustrating. Women facing unsuccessful IVF may not know that endometriosis is the underlying cause, a disease that can impact the success rates of IVF treatments and often has no symptoms. The Receptiva DX test can help identify endometriosis before an embryo transfer, and it has the potential to save women the stress, anxiety, and cost of multiple failed IVF attempts. The good news is multiple studies show treatment of women with a positive Receptiva DX test improves live birth outcomes by over 50%. Receptiva DX can detect all stages of endometriosis and help women make better decisions in planning for pregnancy. You can learn more at ReceptivaDX.com or download their app, which is also called Receptiva DX. Okay, guys. So Monica Beavis is an IVF warrior and advocate, a mindset and holistic fertility coach, and author of the IVF Planner. And today she's going to talk about her fertility journey, starting with being diagnosed with stage four endo, finding out that IVF was her only option to have healthy pregnancies, and then all the things that happened after that. So we're going to talk about successful IVF. We're going to talk about stillbirth. We're going to talk about IVF in the Latin community. We get into all of it. Monica's incredible. You can follow her at Monica Beavis, B-I-V-A-S, on Instagram. And without further ado, this is Monica's infertility story. Monica. Hi. I'm so glad we're finally getting to do this. We've been friends for a while on Instagram, but I haven't really ever had an in-depth conversation with you. So thank you. Well, Ali, thank you so much. As you say, we are friends for a long time in Instagram. We even live in the same state. (laughs) And this is actually (laughs) the first time that we had a minute to see each other. That's right. We've we've talked about going to brunch or meeting up and it just hasn't happened yet because of COVID and all this craziness. Yes, yes, um, but uh, um, I hope that soon we're going to be, you know, able to meet uh, personally like that would I would really be amazing done with some people, yeah. I would love that. So, let's just start at the very beginning with you, Monica. Did you always want to be a mom? Uh, honestly, Ali, no. I I honestly didn't want to be a mom. 
I didn't want even to get married. Uh, and it was because, you know, like uh, probably 27 years ago, when I was still in my early 20s, I thought that the world was a little bit crazy to bring kids into it. And look where we are now. It's crazier mm-hmm. than then. Uh, but then when I met my husband, uh, you know, when I met him, it's going to be 20 years ago. I met him in Match.com. I was living in Colombia because I was born there. And he was living here in New York. He's from Israel. Mm-hmm. So when I met him and, uh, you know, we fall in love. Uh, he had a daughter from a previous uh, marriage. And then, you know, when I came here after we got married, I kind of fall in love with his daughter. And that woke up that motherhood feeling that uh, any woman I think we have. And also by me coming from a very numerous family from my mom's side, there were 18 kids, nine girls, nine boys from the same parents. I have about 243 cousins. Oh, my God. <laughs> That's <laughs> amazing. Know. It's amazing and it's crazy. Yes. And you know, the fun part is every single of my cousins, my girl, uh, my the women, cousins and aunts and everybody, they will get pregnant with a blow of a kiss. Mm. So... When I start to try with my husband, I kind of took it for granted. I'm like, okay, this is genetic. I'm going to get pregnant in the next three months. It never happened. So I was the only one that didn't have that chance. Right. So tell me about what happened with you and your husband when you did start to try. So, you know, I came here. We kind of have a few months for us. And then I right away kind of wanted to have a baby because Daniela, which is my stepdaughter, used to come, you know, every other weekend or and once a week. So when uh, this little girl uh, left, it was, a, you know, a heartbreak for me because she was one year and four months and I got too attached to her. So I said, I want one of my own. So we start to try. And after about eight months, nothing happened. So I, I start to think that I am the problem because he already has a daughter and I supposed to get pregnant very fast from my family history. So I went to the gynecologist, you know, and uh, he was very kind. He said, you know, let's do some blood tests. But still, he explained me that most couples, you know, wait for a year. Mm -hmm. And then if after a year it's not happening, then we go to the test. But he started with the blood test and all of that regular hormonal test and everything came okay. He put me on Clomid, as most, you know, doctors do when it's not happening. Mm -hmm. And then... I went on Clomid for about four or five months to complete that year. Nothing happened. And then he ordered a stereosalpingogram. That was the first test he ordered. He wanted to see my fallopian tubes. So is when we found out that uh, my both fallopian tubes were blocked. Mm. I didn't even know, Ali, that I had endometriosis all my, you know, young years. And this was the cause. It was endometriosis stage four. We tried to open them with two laparoscopies, but it didn't work. So... In that way, you know, our only choice was IVF and Mm -hmm. it was devastating. I was 32 years old and um, I didn't know, I heard what IVF was. And this is 17 years ago when there was no social media, when yes, the treatments were advanced, but not as they are today. So I felt alone. I felt that my body was failing. I felt defective. I was upset on God. I was crying. Mm -hmm. It was terrible. There was no support that we have today. Right. Um, I I was ashamed, you know, it was a time that I, if I tell my family, oh my gosh, I'm the only one that has this issue and I didn't get it like my other people in the family. So it was very frustrating. Culturally, Monica, was it hard to talk to your family about this? Absolutely, Ali. It's so much a taboo in our uh, community, in Latino mm-hmm. community, to levels that is really, uh, I'm going to be honest with you, is disgusting because it all comes from a belief system. I'm not saying that people shouldn't believe in God or shouldn't have a certain religion to believe. I'm myself Jewish. I believe 100% in a higher power, God, Hashem, call it whatever you want. But I think also that there is a lot of um, beliefs that are created by us humans that really um, create a lot of walls. So, you know, for Catholics and, and Christians, in vitro is something that sometimes is seen like out of the hands of God. So, you know, of course, it's very difficult to communicate that with family. Mm-hmm. And also, you know, it's uh, it's difficult to communicate it outside because we feel alone. You know, we feel like we are the only ones that have these issues and everybody else around is getting pregnant, you know, just like out of nowhere, even when they are not planning pregnancy. Totally. Yep. I know that feeling for sure. Yes. 
Of course, that's the good thing about, you know, finding people like you in the community, because I think most people outside could understand, but the ones that really understand is the ones that go through it. Right. So my gynecologist uh, and recommend a doctor in that time, an RE, that he said he was very kind. Also, he had good prices because, you know, IBF comes with a very strong financial impact. Right. And um, that's part of the stress of all the treatment. We went to him, Dr. Brandes, and um, we had to wait like four hours because he had a small clinic and a lot of people were going there because his prices were very affordable. Mm. Um, we did, you know, we waited all the hours that we needed to wait. And he was an amazing doctor. We did our first, second and third IBF cycle with him. Mm-hmm. Our first uh, cycle was successful. It's now my 17 year, almost 17 year old daughter, Leah. Amazing. Yes, next November 9th. Mm, our second cycle was uh, actually mm, a cancel cycle because unfortunately he did some changes in the clinic and they switched charts with another patient. So they gave me the wrong dose and I got OHSS. So my, my cycle had to be canceled. That oh my very- gosh. I, okay. I want to unpack each of these cycles, but go ahead. Tell me about the next one. And then we'll, we, we can dive into these a little bit deeper. Yes, absolutely. Then of course, you know, it was canceled. We were very upset. My husband spoke with him, but he was very responsible. He said to wait, you know, for my ovaries to get a little bit back to normal size. And uh, in the in three months, we waited three months. He's going to give us a cycle with no charge, which he did. Mm. And my third cycle was, I was 37. It went well, you know. I did an amniocentesis, as you know, because of the age. Okay. We were expecting a baby girl. But unfortunately, after week number 22, around that week, I developed some kind of a blood clot issue. And um, I had a stillbirth baby girl at 39 weeks due to blood clots in the umbilical cord. Yeah. So sorry to hear that. That's devastating. Yes, that was actually 10 years ago. It was actually on October 5th, 2010. So you can imagine the unbearable pain. This, This has no name. You know, I always said when we lose our parents, this is something I have so clear. We call orphans, right? When someone loses a wife or the husband, is called widower or widow. Mm-hmm. But when a when a mom and a dad lose a child, and no matter how far you are, because you have even that illusion when you are pregnant, there is no name for that. And as time goes, it's harder. Yeah, that's so true. There's no name for it. You're right. No. There is no name. So that's why it's something that people cannot describe. You say it's an unbearable. It's a, it's a pain that is worse than a, that, you know, like if you cut yourself, you know, that you're going to, you know, have a, put a bandaid or something's going to close, but that pain is very difficult to handle. Uh, it was crazy. It gave us a lot of, of pain, emotional. And also because, you know, men and women, we grieve differently. Mm-hmm. So a situation like this can bring a lot of uh, stress and burden into a relationship as well. Mm-hmm. So it it brought a lot of <laughs> crazy shit to my marriage too. Yeah. And, Look, yes. Tell me a little bit more about that. What was your grieving process versus your husband's? It was um it was very different, Ali, because we women are more emotional. So I used to cry and and get and take out my pain. In, in crying and expressing and more, we have more feelings of guiltiness and all of that. So we are more, we show our vulnerability mm-hmm. more open. Men, men doesn't, you know, because they also, it's a belief system, you know, they teach men, okay, men is a provider, is the strength, yeah, men don't cry, you know, it's all of that. Mm-hmm. So he right away kind of, yes, he cried the day the baby was born and he was devastated. He used to put feeling to pray but then like after a week the guy went into work right away and it was like nothing happened so for me it was like he was not feeling pain Mm -hmm. and um i was judging him you know i was like this is not right you you didn't care but at the same time i i misjudged him because that was his way of grieving Mm-hmm. The, the way for him was like I need to go to work because I don't want to think about it I don't want to get drawn into that pain he explained me later and what he did was going to work and he started to to drink mm-hmm. so it created a lot of tension between us right 
How did you guys get back to a good place? Was it a long process? Did you go to therapy or what were your coping It mechanisms? was a long process because, you know, the problem with me was that right away I wanted to fill the empty space of that baby that I lost. Mm -hmm. So what I did is I spoke with our RE and I told him, I want to jump right away in another IBF. I cannot, I cannot, you know, like I cannot live without a baby. Mm -hmm. And he told me, I'm sorry, but I think that you mentally, emotionally and physically, you are not ready and you need at least to wait that your body get clean from the pregnancy and your last cycle. Uh, I put him against the wall. My husband also told me we need to grieve, you know, we need to, to wait. And he said he's not going to do it. So he recommended me another doctor from RMA, New York. I think, mm -hmm. you know, RMA, New York, Dr. Mukherjee. Yes, I went to and RMA and Dr. Klein when he was still there. Oh, really? Oh, my gosh. Mm -hmm. Dr. Amazing. Joshua Klein. Yeah, there's a couple. I think there's two different Dr. Kleins. Yes, there is two. There was there was another one in Long Island IBF that now is RMA of Long Island. Mm -hmm. I, I did my last cycle there with Dr. Brenner. So I went to Dr. Mukherjee. We told him the, the, the story and he said the same. He, he didn't want me to do it. But Ali, you know how we are, how women we are when we want to be mummies. Oh, absolutely. You'll do anything, right? Yeah, and I, I probably the only thing that I was missing was a gun <laughs> because I put them against the wall, him and my husband, and he said, okay, I'm going to do it. And we did it. I got pregnant, but it was, you know, there was a risk of not having a successful uh, pregnancy and it happens. I miscarriage at seven and a half weeks. So what I did to myself was putting more pain, more burden, more, you know, like craziness. I'm not going to lie to you after that. I thought about taking my life. Oh my gosh. There is, um, yes. There is, I'm open book on that because yeah. it's, it's so, terrible. So this is after the stillbirth of your baby. You had a, a miscarriage. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Okay. Oh, I'm so sorry again. So yeah. Tell me about the level of devastation and depression and just sadness that you felt after that, that led you to these, you know, suicidal thoughts. Yes, because, you know, the, the thing is that when we have something like a stillbirth, when the pregnancy is on the third trimester, we start to blame ourselves. It's kind of the same feeling of um, when when they tell you, OK, you are infertile, you need to go to a, a ART treatment. You feel mm -hmm. that your body failed. You maybe start to feel that guiltiness that did I do something wrong? Did I move uh, wrong? So when I had the stillbirth, I start to think back and say, maybe I pick up Elia when I was too big, you know, and I put pressure on the baby. Right. So you blame yourself. Lot. Yeah, it, exactly. So that blame, when we start to have pity on ourselves, we are putting ourselves in a very dark place. And this happened I will say with anyone that even get to a point to even take their own life, there is a moment that is so dark that you don't find any light. So they get there. But what saved me, I tell you, is I am super scared, Ali. And now for sometimes I, I laugh about it. It's funny to say, but what I am scared terribly from physical pain. I cut myself with a freaking paper and I'm like, oh my gosh, and I see a little bit of blood and I feel like I'm going to dismay. Right. So I went, it's funny to say, but I went through the internet, you know, Dr. Google and all of that. And I started to look what is the, the less painful physical way to die. And the only one that I found, it was a very crazy. And then I start to think, look, the mind works insane i start to think okay if i do this then whatever maybe i, I don't die then i'm gonna end up in jail with with a force uh, chair like in a crazy house oh my with gosh, the pain yeah. of losing my daughter and in a you know like in in jail in a crazy hospital so that honestly ali was stopped me i didn't do any therapy i had my mom with with us she's been with us since our daughters both born Mm -hmm. My mom is a very a strong woman and she used to tell me, I feel sad, but I'm not going to start to cry with you because I'm going to drag you more to darkness. So it's okay if you want to cry, but it's okay if you also one day wake up and you laugh from something that you hear funny, because that's another thing. Once you, you have a loss and maybe you have a little moment during the process of grieving that you smile or you laugh the guilt comes right away. But why I'm laughing? I just lost a baby. I shouldn't be laughing. I should be crying and, you know, devastated. Right. 
I think it's so important that you say that because it's true. Like all these feelings are so valid. Anybody who's experienced some type of loss, whether it be a stillbirth or a miscarriage or loss of an embryo or loss of a, you know, a canceled cycle, you know, we always say a loss is a loss and it's not the pain Olympics. It doesn't matter. You know, everybody's entitled to grieve and feel these feelings. So I think it's so important that you say that it is okay to be happy at a certain point again, or to have moments of happiness, even though you're grieving too, it's, it's not a straight line, you know, it's the emotions are very complicated. And I think sometimes we beat ourselves up as women and say, well, I'm supposed to be sad, or I'm supposed to be grieving, but it's just not like that. You know, it's, it's not black and white like that. No, absolutely. You are so right. And and part of the grieving is that even having a smile and feel that guiltiness, but then look back and say, you know, I'm human, life moves on. And especially, um, you know, we are very selfish. Humans, we are very selfish. I, I don't judge anyone. And for example, when I, I have even in my own family have cases two times of cousins that they took their lives. Mm -hmm. I don't judge them uh, because again, I go to the point that people that do that, they, they really have tried everything and they, the only way that they can see life is doing that. Although the action I consider it selfish because then you don't know how you affect your surroundings, the people that love you. So what also helped me was that my mom actually told me, you know, she said, and my husband too, he said, we have another daughter. You are missing times with her because mm -hmm. of your pain. So you need to really look at what you have. And the baby, Isabel, she will not want to see mom sad and, and leaving uh, the other daughter like on the side so all of this I start to kind of put all the pieces together like a like a puzzle and I start to work on myself Ali but I will say not everybody can do it by themselves and I think that sometimes we need help we need a therapist we need a psychologist we need a coach we need mm -hmm. someone that have gone through the same to um, help us to see that light. I didn't have nobody, but I have mama, I have my husband, even though he was grieving in his own way. Right. And one of the other important things is grieving is important. Grieving is some is, is a process. So it, it comes with the denial because you don't want, you know, I used to go to sleep and say, okay, I'm going to wake up and my baby's going to be next to me. Mm. And, and it didn't. So that's denial. It's part, it comes with the part of being upset with God, of, of wanting, of course, to don't feel that pain and even have that suicidal thoughts are normal. But if you feel that you are not getting nowhere, I definitely suggest that whomever is going through that, and it doesn't matter how far the pregnancy is or how old has been the child that you have lost, to look for help. Absolutely. And just know anybody listening that might be in a dark space, please know you're not alone. Reach out to us on Instagram or find somebody you know, it doesn't mean you have to share your story publicly, but just please know there's people out there, you know, whether it be a therapist or a family member or a friend, and sometimes even just telling one person what you're going through can help kind of lighten that mental load and, and, you know, help you know that your feelings are valid and that you're not alone. Exactly. Definitely. Ali. Yeah. Let's backtrack a little bit, Monica, to, you said that first cycle that did work. And you said, how old is your daughter now? Did you say she's going to, she's going to be 17. On okay. So you were going through this, like you said, where there was no Instagram, no, there was like no books, no podcasts, no um, support was minimal. So a different time. It's wild how much it's changed in the past, you know, 17 years, 20 years even. But tell me about when you did find out that cycle that it had worked and the feelings of that. And, and like, how was the pregnancy after infertility for you? Because I know that can have its own set of anxieties. Yes, absolutely. So one of the first things that the doctor told us very honestly open, he was amazing, is listen, most people don't have success in the first cycle. So mm -hmm. please do not have expectations. Mm -hmm. Be, and, and you know, it's like that. But some people have a success. So when we start with the medicines, he was amazing because, and I told him, okay, we're going to do that. I don't want to expect you always go with the What if, what if? And, um, but I ask all the questions. So I told him, I want you to tell me, as you see, for example, my follicles grow and all of that to tell me honestly how you see them. Mm -hmm. Because if, if I see that you tell me something that is not right, so then I will, I, I was thinking I will right away look for egg donor or something, other options. Cause I start, of course, to read in Google mm -hmm. all of about IVF. 
Right. But he was he was very honest and he said that during the process, every time I will go to take a blood test and you know to measure our follicles, he used to tell me, I tell you something, Monica, you might have you know have the issue of your blocking tubes. Because I told him about my family, all the quantity of cousins that I have, but he was very clear and he said, I see you as very fertile. Every follicle will have an egg and it will grow as expected. He say, thank God, you need to thank God that he sent you fixed. (laughs) It was Mm -hmm. so funny because if not, you will be pregnant every nine months. He used to tell me that. So I see a big possibility that your cycle is going to be success. And uh, it happened, you know, I, I, I tried to put all the, the positivity, although like you say, there was no support and I was, I had days that I will cry and cry and cry just with the fear of what if and then you know the two-week wait comes and uh, it's even worse Ali the two-week wait is even worse because okay you wait and then you go to the beta test and they tell you it's positive we put in that time for embryos that's another thing that has changed today they allow one embryo because Mm -hmm. technology and medicine have been so advanced that the percentage of success is also uh, bigger. Mm-hmm. We put four embryos and only one developed, which is my daughter. And uh, once the positive test came, you know, the beta test, I always in every cycle start to spot. So, you know, like six days after the beta test yes. is positive, I will start to spot. And Ali, I will go every five seconds to the bathroom. Totally. Oh my gosh, it's a nightmare. So yeah. I remember my husband telling me, listen, you need to stop. Is normal. We're going to call the doctor. So we call and he said, yes, spotting is normal. Please mm-hmm. try to chill, whatever. You know, if you see that you are filling up a, a path with blood, then you come. So it was a nightmare up to when I passed the first trimester, which is normal. You know, most people say once you pass the first trimester, it's going to be OK. So then mm-hmm. I start to be more chill, calm. And then when the baby started to move, I was okay. One time that she didn't move, we went crazy because it's my first pregnancy. We went to the hospital. They did a sonogram. She was sleeping. So, but she was okay. And this is the mistake I think I made with my stillbirth. She stopped to move. And I told my husband that I don't feel like right. And he was like, but remember it happens with Elia, with our first pregnancy. And Mm -hmm. I said, yes, okay. And that is something that I still kind of work mentally Mm. because it's that little guilt in the back of my mind why I didn't do it. But Ali, something that, you know, it's not up to me. It's up to the higher power. It needed to happen. So I don't know the reason. Yes. And you can't blame yourself. I mean, we do that again as as women for the most part. And just, you know, what did I do? Like you said earlier, I shouldn't have lifted that thing or I shouldn't have drank that or done that or, you know, but the fact of the matter is it's not your fault when you have a loss, you know? Exactly. So, exactly. yeah, I'm so sorry again that you had to go through that. Yes. Yes. But you know, like I, I said to most people, my pain became my purpose and all of that have taught me a, a big lesson, you know? like Yes. Let's talk about that. So now you are such an outspoken advocate for infertility or an IVF warrior you are the author of the IVF planner. Tell me about why this is so important to you and why you're so passionate about it. Well, Ali, definitely uh, because I went through it. Mm-hmm. It is is like it didn't happen from from the first cycle, not even in the second or the third, you know, uh, or the fourth. That was a miscarriage. Actually, it happened when after the miscarriage and uh, after the stillbirth and my marriage almost, you know, crumbled. Mm -hmm. Uh, we took a year with my husband and said okay we are done with treatments for now we need to focus on working as a couple on working as parents to Elia and then we're gonna wait to see if all you know if we work out if we solidify our family as couple and parents and then we will go to a last cycle Mm -hmm. so it happens and we went to a last cycle with the decision that no matter what the result the outcome of the cycle it will it will be the last one. So mm-hmm. if we got pregnant, beautiful, but if we not, so we stay with Elia. Yes. I had the same thing, Monica, with my husband. We, we were like, okay, we're doing one cycle. If it doesn't work, we're closing this chapter. Because for me, it had been, you know, a three, almost four year process of miscarriage after miscarriage. And, yes. you know, so we had, we had to put a cap on it. We we're, you know, like as a couple or else we weren't going to make it through. 
Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely, Ali. And there is a moment that you, if you stay there, you are, well, of course, each person have, and each couple have a, a decision making kind of setup, right? Of course. But and everybody's it, threshold is different and everyone's experience is different. I'm just saying that was our experience was we're like, oh, okay. Exactly. And, and, but I am agree with you because mm-hmm. sometimes it's like, it's like too crazy, you know? So, and what we, some people can go for 17, 20 cycles. I have clients that have gone that, but I will not be able to do that because I also want to live life. Mm-hmm. Let's, that's the honest truth. Mm-hmm. So we did our fifth cycle uh, in Long Island IVF, which now is RMA, uh, RMA of Long Island. And in that time we put only three embryos. Dr. Brenner suggests us to put only three. I got pregnant. Uh, of twins but then you know after the two week wait as usual I start to spot but I start to spot a little heavier so I you know I call him we went and he said yes you know you're pregnant from twins but one was detaching and then we saw a heartbeat on the other one Mm -hmm. so that is now Maya that she's nine years old but Mm -hmm. I tell you once these babies start to move Ali I learned from the A to C all the movements and I even knew at what time exactly she will move when I was sleeping. And if this girl was not moving, I will wake up my husband like a crazy woman telling him to bring me chocolate or (laughs) Coca-Cola. Something to stimulate. Yeah. So wait, you you implanted three embryos? Yes. That's so interesting because that doesn't happen anymore. No, no. And in my first cycles, in the first one, the second, first, no, first one, third and fourth, Uh we put four embryos. Wow. Yes. That doesn't happen anymore because times they are a change in. It's yeah, cool to hear that. You know, it's really cool to hear that. Yes. Yes. And one thing I say is like when a lot of women and couples say, okay, they're telling me that my clock is ticking. My age is a problem. I understand because our eggs uh, age with our age, but I also think that if we have a good, uh, like a healthy lifestyle, today we see women over 40 uh, having kids. I was a mom of Maya almost when I was 42. Mm-hmm. Um, 40, I was 41 actually. And it was beautiful, you know, like uh, this girl, of course, is super hyper because I didn't let her sleep the whole pregnancy. Mm. And actually <laughs> that, <laughs> that last pregnancy, that last cycle is what inspired me. I say what I'm doing, you know, I, I don't want to be only a housewife. There is so many people going through the same that I went, infertility, uh, you know, financials, in, in financial impact, stillbirth, miscarriage. Why I don't do something to be a support for them? And I wrote the book too, because you know how it is, the IBF uh, uh, appointment. You need to take notes of your levels of the blood, uh, the size of the eggs. And I have little papers all over and they got lost. Mm-hmm. So, totally. So the IVF planner keeps it all tight, keeps it all yes. straight. I could have used that too. Cause same, I was like jotting down what to take when and pieces of paper all over the place. And <laughs> such a thing didn't exist when I, when I was going through it, or at least I didn't know about it. No. Um, and then I discovered also that, for example, when we are going through these kind of cycles, we need to try our best to just to try. First of all, if we feel emotional and we feel shit, and I'm, I'm, I'm telling you like straight up, you need to allow to feel emotional and shit. And if you need to curse, cry, scream, mm-hmm. write, whatever it is, do it. Because when we pile the emotions is when we really uh, stuck in the feeling. So mm-hmm. feeling what we feel during these cycles is absolutely okay. And you need to feel it. Don't let yourself bomb with toxic positivity. But once you feel, when you allow to feel all these shitty feelings, mm-hmm. anxiety, emotions, you will feel that it's kind of, okay, you feel the kind of, I let go when you cry, give it a 15 minute, 20 minute to cry and to get out all that crap. And then you're going to feel kind of empty with that empty that you have feeling now, like kind of relief. I used to color. I used to read funny books or watch funny movies. So then you have the space to work that part. So the cycle, the part of that infertility treatment is going to be a little bit easier. Mm -hmm. So I have already a book that probably I'm going to launch in a month. It's a coloring book that calls Ranting Doodles. And it's all little eggs and sperms to color. I love it. (laughs) <laughs> yes, yes. I'm working on finishing that. It's finished, but I need to publish it. So I will always suggest to anyone going, even trying to conceive naturally, you know, try to balance. I'm not saying 
just fill yourself with positive thoughts and don't cry, Mm -mm. but balance. Feel Mm -hmm. the feelings that are crappy, but also once you feel them, check what you can do to ease your journey. Mm -hmm. Totally, totally. So if people want to work with you, Monica, they can go check you out on Instagram at Monica Beavis. So M-O-N-I-C-A-B-I-V-A-S on Instagram. And you've got your IVF planner, which is available. The coloring book, which is soon to come out. Does the coloring book have a title? Yes, Ranting Doodles. Oh, I love that. Okay, oh, yes, you said that. Okay. because we rant all the time when we are going through a process. Yes. Of so good. So just to wrap up here, is there anything else you'd like to say to anybody who might be new to this world or just feeling really shitty right now? Yes. There is, it's, it's something that is most of us know, you know, after the storm always come a rainbow. There is never darkness forever. And I give a typical, like the most close example that we are having is what the world is going on right now. Look the last two years, what happened, how it changed the lives of so many. So there is always someone out there or some situation out there that is going through, through much harder times than us. And in this case, I always use comparison because uh, believe it or not, when we recognize that there is someone or or something in the world that is super choking, then we can put our situation and say, okay, you know, thank God, because I'm not in that place. Let me see how I can handle this. Mm-hmm. So make sure to understand that whatever pain you are going through, it has a purpose. I cannot tell you what it is. You know, this is more of a higher power God. There is things that we will never know, but always, always, always something good comes from a difficult and painful situation. There is no doubt about it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening today, guys. Definitely check out Fertility Rally if you need a community. We open our doors again on January 1st. We've got four support groups a week and more coming soon. More, more, more coming soon. It's going to be amazing. We've got three private Facebook groups. We've got a community of more than 500 people all over the globe who are there to support you and hold your hand and answer your questions and all that good stuff. It is such a great community. It's the place I wish I had when I was in the midst of it. So check us out on the interwebs at fertilityrally.com on Instagram at fertility rally. And as always, you can reach out to me at infertile life stories on IG as well. So thank you for listening. Thanks again to Monica for sharing her story and I will talk to you guys next week. Thank you.